I'm Regan. One of the things we do here at the Biomedical Imaging Unit is help to diagnose a condition called primary ciliary dyskinesia, or PCD. So PCD is where the hair-like structures in your airways and nose, called cilia, don't move properly to allow evacuation of mucus and bacteria from the airways. So once the sample has been cut and prepared using ultramicrotomy, we can insert it into the transmission electron microscope, or TEM, and th this allows us to look inside of the cilia themselves to look at the structure of them to see if there's anything defective about the structure. So over here we have some nice epithelial cells, which are the cells which line your airways, and on them are some cilia, so these little tiny dotty things are cilia. So like I said before, they are hair-like structures, so this is one cut longitudinally along the length of the cilium, and we can see it's long, um, and it's got these black bits in it, and the black things are tubules, and they're what we are interested in. So if we cut this the other way, so as a cross-section, we can see that they have a really nice, regular, uniform structure. So we have lots of them here. And if we go in a little bit closer, you can see that they have a nice normal arrangement and we can see the microtubules really clearly there. And if you would like to know more about PCD, if you carry on watching, I can explain some more about it. I'm now going to give some more information on primary ciliary dyskinesia, or PCD, and the diagnosis. So firstly, what exactly are cilia? Cilia are hair-like organelles that project from a cell body, and there are two types of cilia. So there are motile, which move, and there are primary or non-motile, which don't move and just serve as sensory organelles. So on the left-hand side, we've got a scanning electron micrograph of some cilia, which are the really long things here, which line the edge of the uh, epithelial cell. And these little things here are just all microvilli as well. So motile cilia can be found throughout the body and their primary function is to beat to aid the movement of fluid. So in the respiratory tract, they beat together to aid the movement of mucus and the mucus is in your respiratory tract in order to capture any dirt and bacteria that you inhale. So this then needs, the mucus with the dirt and bacteria stuck in it needs to then be moved up and out of the airways. In the reproductive tract, they line the fallopian tubes and aid the transport of oocytes and embryos towards the uterus. They can be found in the inner ear. They can be found in the ventricles of the brain to help aid the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. And they also make up the sperm tail structure as well, which aids the movement of the sperm. In order to aid the movement of fluid, cilia beat in unison in a specific pattern, and this is at around 11 to 20 hertz. So in this video here, we've got some cilia lining the edge of an epithelial cell, which is taken from the airways. And we can see that they're beating effectively as we have little particulates in the sort of gray bit in the bottom left corner, which are moving along quite nicely. So this is what would happen in your airways. So like I said before, cilia are hair-like structures, but if we were to cut one in half and look inside of it, we can look at the ultrastructure of the cilium. So as you can see here, we have um, a diagram of a cilium and we have a central core or an axoneme. Then we have two central microtubules surrounded by an outer ring of nine pairs of microtubules, which are then surrounded by a membrane. And things to note as well are these tiny little red things here, which are called outer dining arms and then inner dining arms, and these are what powers the cilium to move. So what exactly is PCD? So PCD is a rare genetic disorder, which is an autosomal recessive trait, therefore both parents need to be carriers of the genes for PCD. And it can affect 1 in 15,000 to 1 in 30,000 people, but this can increase to what, up to 1 in 400 in consanguineous groups. So in patients with PCD, the cilia don't work properly, and this can lead to a buildup of mucus, which can cause swelling and infection in the lungs and ears. So some symptoms of PCD include respiratory distress of the newborn, reduced mucus clearance from lungs and airways, recurring lung infections, 
situs inversus or dextrocardia and situs inversus is where the organs in the body are all on the opposite side of the body to what they normally should be on. Um, and lastly, subfertility and infertility in adulthood. And these are just some of the symptoms. So how can we diagnose PCD? What clinical tests can we use? Firstly, the clinical history of the patient would be looked at to see if there's a family history of PCD. Next, we can perform a lung function test and then we can perform a nasal nitric oxide test. So normally nasal nitric oxide is around 500 parts per billion. However, in PCD, anything less than 100 parts per billion can be seen. We can do blood and saliva tests for genetic studies. However, we don't have all of the genes for PCD just yet. And then we can perform a nasal brushing biopsy. So this is where a small brush goes up into the nose and it gets twisted around in order to remove some of the epithelial cells lining, lining the nose and airways for us to have a look at. And we can look at them using light microscopy or electron microscopy, as well as immunofluorescence. So I'm going to focus today on just light microscopy and electron microscopy. Firstly, light microscopy analysis. Light microscopy can be performed on live cells, so straight from the biopsy. And this is using a microscope with a high speed video camera attachment to it. So here we have some epithelial cells and we have the cilia lining the edge of the cells. And here are actually some static cilia. So I'm playing the video, but you can see that they're not actually moving. And therefore we would get a buildup of this mucus here on the left with tiny little particles in it that just wouldn't move anywhere. So here we can tell that th this patient is probably going to have something defective about the inner or the outer or both dynein arms. Here we have some dyskinetic cilia. So these are cilia that are moving, but they're not moving together in unison with one another. And they're not performing a full sweep either. So the particles on the left hand side are not really moving anywhere at all. They're just staying there. This, this is a top view of an epithelial cell cluster. And if I press play, you can see that there is rotation of the cilia as opposed to beating together in unison. After we've used high speed video and light microscopy to view the cilia, we can then perform electron microscopy analysis. We can use a transmission electron microscope or a TEM in order to view the ultrastructure of the cilia. So I'm not going to talk too much about TEM because there's another video on it. However, we, we can use it because it goes to very high magnifications and it gives us a very good resolution. So here is a ciliated epithelial cell edge. So here's the epithelial cells here. We have a goblet cell here or a mucus producing cell. So these are all mucus granules inside of the goblet cell. We have some microvilli here, which line the, also line the edge of the epithelial cell. And then we have some longitudinal cilia. And then we have a lot of sort of transverse cilia. And these are the ones we're interested in. Those are the cross sections we'd be interested in. Here is a recap on the ultrastructure of the cilium. So on the left hand side we have a diagram and on the right hand side we have an actual transmission electron micrograph of a cilium. So again we've got the central pair here, we've got the nine outer doublets around the outside surrounded by the membrane and then we have this outer dynein arm structure and then we have inner dynein arm structures. I'm just going to go over some of the more common ultrastructural defects that we can see in patients that have PCD. So in picture number one, we've got an absence of outer dynein arms. So here's an empty space where the dynein arm should be. And in a patient with this defect, the cilia wouldn't move properly. So they would maybe move a little bit, but not to their full extent. In picture number two, we have inner dynein arm defect with microtubular disorganization. So as you can see, it's completely lost its nine plus two structure. And we are actually missing the inner dynein arms from these, these microtubules. So again, not much movement would be seen when looking at high speed video. And then an essential complex defect, we're completely missing our central pair. And the central pair is what determines the direction in which the cilium is going to beat in. So if there's no determination of direction, the cilia would just rotate instead. 
Here is another example image. So this cilium here is missing its outer and its inner dynein arms, as you can see here. Therefore, the patient that has this defect, their cilia would be completely static by high speed video. In this image, we have an inner dynein arm loss. So there's no inner arms and we have microtubular disorganization again as well. So again, there would be a lack of movement whilst looking at high speed video. And in this one, we have again the central complex loss. So these would all be rotating. And here we have a transposition defect, which is basically where one of the um, outer doublets has moved its way into the middle. So if you look closely, you can see that this, this isn't actually a central pair. This is one of the outer doublets, which is moved from the outside into the middle. This is what it should look like. And this is where it's completely lost. And again, just to show that video of the rotation, here they are rotating again. In order to quantify the defect or the potential defect, we need to count the cilia whilst being on the TEM. So this is an example spreadsheet of a normal count result. So we would input the numbers which we count and it would work out the percentages down here for each of the different options. So we have microtubular defects, inner arm defects and outer arm defects. And you can see in this patient we have 6% microtubular defects with 0% inner arm and 0% outer arm defects. So it is perfectly normal to have some microtubular defects as a secondary um, rather than a primary effect in a normal patient. However, in this case, we have an inner dynein arm defect with microtubular disorganization. So you can see that we have 83% microtubular defects, 100% inner arm defects and 2% outer arm defects. OK, so that's it from me. If you would like any more information on PCD, if you go back to the SOTSEF website uh, to Marvelous Microscopes, and there should be a link for a YouTube video from the PCD support team.